Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi stated that millions of Egyptians would reject the forced displacement of Palestinians into Sinai, emphasizing that such a move would turn the peninsula into a base for attacks against Israel. He suggested that Palestinians in Gaza could be moved to Israel's Negev Desert instead. Sisi rejected any attempt to resolve the Palestinian issue through military means or forced displacement and warned that Egyptians would protest in millions against any displacement of Gaza's residents to Sinai. The comments came amid concerns about the potential transfer of Palestinians from Gaza to Sinai due to the conflict with Israel. The UN Security Council scheduled a vote on a resolution condemning terrorist attacks by Hamas on Israel and all violence against civilians, while calling for humanitarian pauses to deliver aid to Gaza. The draft resolution, sponsored by Brazil, faced negotiations on wording. The vote followed the rejection of a Russian-drafted resolution that made no mention of Hamas. Russia proposed two amendments to the Brazil resolution, calling for a humanitarian ceasefire and condemning indiscriminate attacks on civilians and assaults on civilian objects in Gaza. An emergency meeting was scheduled to discuss the hospital explosion in Gaza City. Footage of the explosion at Al-Ali Hospital in Gaza suggests it was likely caused by a missile fired from within Gaza, according to open-source analysts. The strike killed hundreds, with conflicting claims of responsibility between Israel and Islamic Jihad. The Israel Defense Forces, IDF, denied involvement, presenting drone footage that suggested the rocket used did not match Israeli ammunition. Analysts using geolocation and open-source intelligence concluded that a missile launched by a Palestinian group exploded mid-air and caused the hospital explosion. U.S. President Joe Biden ordered his national security team to investigate the incident. Protests erupted in various Arab countries, including the West Bank, Jordan, Lebanon, and Egypt, following the blast at a Gaza hospital. Leaders, including Egypt's President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, Jordan's King Abdullah II, and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, cancelled a planned summit with U.S. President Joe Biden. Arab protesters blamed their leaders for failing to prevent the alleged Israeli attack. The Arab street, fueled by a raw nerve of Palestinian suffering and angered by U.S.-brokered normalization agreements between Israel and Arab states, threatens broader unrest in the region. Hamas has indicated a willingness to release women and children it holds captive, but it acknowledges that it does not have custody of all the hostages seized in the recent attack on Israel. Some hostages are held by Palestinian Islamic Jihad and others by random Gaza citizen opportunists. Hamas, which controls Gaza, is trying to gain custody of all captives but says it cannot amid continued bombing. Talks on the fate of the hostages have been ongoing, with Hamas initially pushing for a prisoner exchange, but now, it seems to have accepted that civilians will have to be released without a trade. The U.S. military intercepted two drones aiming to attack its forces in Iraq, marking the first such attack in over a year. While the officials did not reveal the suspected entity behind the attack, tensions are rising in the region, with a particular focus on Iran-backed groups. Last week, Iraqi groups aligned with Iran threatened to target U.S. interests if the U.S. intervened in the Israel-Hamas conflict. The intercepted drones were reportedly targeting Iraq's Al-Assad air base, which hosts American troops. This incident comes amid heightened regional tension over the Israel-Hamas war, with the situation escalating further after an explosion at a Gaza hospital that killed hundreds of Palestinians. Some Iraqi leaders blamed Israel for the hospital attack, and Qatib Hezbollah, a powerful armed faction with ties to Iran, accused the U.S. of supporting Israel, threatening consequences if U.S. forces did not leave Iraq. The U.S. State Department has raised its travel advisory level for Lebanon to level 4, do not travel, urging Americans not to travel to the country due to the unpredictable security situation related to rocket, missile, and artillery exchanges between Israel and Hezbollah or other armed militant factions. The advisory comes in the wake of protests across the region, including Lebanon, following a massive blast at a Gaza hospital that was believed to have killed hundreds. The State Department has also authorized the voluntary, temporary departure of family members of U.S. government personnel and some non-emergency personnel from the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman agreed to collaborate in improving humanitarian conditions in Gaza and easing tensions in the Israel-Hamas conflict. The leaders expressed the need for close cooperation between their countries and working together to enhance the humanitarian situation and de-escalate the conflict. 
Japan, as the current chair of the G7, recently announced a plan to provide $10 million in emergency humanitarian aid to Gaza. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden arrived in Israel, expressing solidarity with Israel in its conflict with Hamas and commenting on the recent blast at a Gaza hospital. British Foreign Minister James cleverly announced plans to travel to the Middle East, with a diplomatic push that may include visits to Egypt, Qatar, and Turkey. Cleverly emphasized the need for cool heads and diplomatic efforts to prevent the Israel-Hamas conflict from escalating further. The visit is expected to involve discussions on the opening of a border crossing between Gaza and Egypt to facilitate the flow of humanitarian aid and allow citizens to leave the area. Cleverly had visited Israel last week in the aftermath of attacks by the Palestinian militant group Hamas. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban held a rare in-person meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Beijing, focusing on Hungary's access to Russian energy. The meeting comes amid EU sanctions against Moscow, and Orban's stance on the Ukraine conflict has caused disagreements with other European leaders. Hungary, highly dependent on Russian energy, has resisted EU sanctions and blocked a military aid package to Ukraine. The meeting is seen as a sign of potential division within the EU's unified stance on Ukraine. Orban reiterated a call for a ceasefire and immediate peace talks in Ukraine. Putin is attending the Belt and Road Forum in Beijing and holding meetings with other leaders, including Serbia's President Aleksandr Vucic, raising concerns in Europe about closer ties to Russia and China. Russian President Vladimir Putin accepted an invitation from Vietnamese President Vo Van Thuong to visit Vietnam soon during their meeting on the sidelines of China's Belt and Road Forum. Vietnam, a close partner of Russia, has historical ties developed during the Soviet era, and it is a major buyer of Russian weapons. The leaders discussed deepening cooperation in various sectors, including trade, security, and defense. Vietnam and Russia are considering new arms deals, with around 80% of Vietnam's arsenal consisting of Russian-supplied weapons. The visit is part of Vietnam's balanced foreign policy, as it recently upgraded ties with the United States and is preparing to possibly host China's President Xi Jinping later this year. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping met in Beijing, emphasizing the need for close foreign policy coordination amid growing concerns about potential conflicts with the West. The leaders discussed trade and marked the 10th anniversary of Xi's Belt and Road Initiative, which has faced criticism for leaving many nations heavily indebted to Chinese banks. Putin highlighted the importance of strong bilateral relations, mentioning that trade is expected to exceed $200 billion this year. China is a crucial customer for Russian oil and gas, offering economic support to Russia amid Western sanctions. The meeting took place as Russia faces international criticism for its invasion of Ukraine, and China attempts to position itself as a neutral peace broker, a stance widely dismissed by the global community. Rare footage showed Russian President Vladimir Putin in Beijing accompanied by officers carrying the Tchegat, the country's nuclear briefcase that can be used to order a nuclear strike. The briefcase is traditionally carried by a naval officer and is equipped with a secure communication system linking the president to military top brass and, ultimately, to rocket forces. The footage highlighted the significance of the nuclear briefcase, which is always with the president but is rarely filmed. Putin's visit to Beijing occurred amid heightened tensions between Russia and the West, particularly the United States, and as China seeks to strengthen its nuclear capabilities. Adams missiles to Ukraine, stating that it prolongs the conflict and constitutes a mistake by the U.S. He emphasized that external factors strengthen Russia-China cooperation, adding that the U.S. is becoming more involved in the Ukraine conflict. Putin mentioned the deployment of Russian planes with Kinzhal hypersonic missiles over the Black Sea and urged a peaceful resolution to the crisis based on new realities, referring to Russia's control of a part of Ukraine. A Russian missile attack in southern Ukraine killed two civilians, marking an escalation in the conflict. Russian President Vladimir Putin dismissed the impact of the U.S.-supplied Army tactical missile system, ADAKMS, which Ukraine claimed to use in destroying Russian helicopters and other assets. Putin acknowledged the additional threat but asserted it wouldn't change the overall situation. Russia's ambassador to the U.S. called the U.S. decision to supply ADAKMS reckless. The conflict remains largely deadlocked, with both sides seeking advantages on the battlefield. The UK Defence Ministry noted Russian forces attempting to push forward in eastern Ukraine but deemed a major breakthrough highly unlikely. 
Vladimir Putin's visit to China aims to strengthen the alliance against the West, emphasizing the No Limits partnership announced with Xi Jinping in 2022. However, business activity in border zones doesn't match political rhetoric. Infrastructure projects, like a newly built bridge, have not lived up to expectations, with reports of large shopping centers closed due to a lack of patrons. Some business people blame the absence of Russian tourists, while others cite new Russian tariffs. Despite trade challenges, China supports Russia, piping more natural gas into its northeastern province and using state-controlled media to back Putin's war effort. Turkey's parliament has extended the military's authorization for cross-border operations in Syria and Iraq for an additional two years. Initially approved in 2013 to support the fight against the Islamic State, the authorization has been renewed annually and extended for two years in 2021. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan cited the need to protect Turkey's national security against various risks and threats as the rationale for the extension. The motion also mentioned Turkey's willingness to welcome foreign troop deployments on its soil to combat terror groups under circumstances determined by the president. The move faced criticism from the main opposition party, which opposes the presence of foreign troops on Turkish soil. The cross-border operations primarily target Kurdish groups, including the People's Protection Units, YPG, which Ankara considers a terror group with links to the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK. The latest extension comes in response to an October 1 bombing in Ankara claimed by a PKK branch. South Korea, the United States, and Japan are reportedly set to hold their first joint aerial exercise near the Korean Peninsula. The exercise is expected to involve the USB-52 strategic bomber and fighter jets from the three countries, potentially taking place on Sunday. While South Korean defense officials have not confirmed the details, they noted that the three nations are expanding joint military exercises based on an agreement made in August at the Camp David summit. This move comes amid increased tensions with North Korea and efforts to strengthen trilateral security cooperation in the face of regional challenges. Additionally, a three-way communications hotline among South Korea, the US, and Japan has been completed. South Korean defense contractor Hanwha Ocean has submitted proposals to build submarines to Canada, the Philippines, and Poland as part of South Korea's effort to become one of the world's top four defense exporters. Canada is considering potential builders for new submarines, expressing interest in Hanwha Ocean among others. The company has also responded to Poland's inquiries about its submarine building capabilities. Additionally, Hanwha Ocean is competing to sell diesel-powered submarines to the Philippines, which is seeking to acquire two submarines over 2,000 tons. The company's proposals include submarines with lithium-ion batteries, offering an advantage in extended underwater capabilities.